Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Out of Home Office Hours. Thank you for joining our session. Um, we had a lot of people, a lot of interest in this session. There were more than 500 people signed up, so, so thank you. Um, we're as excited as you all are about this upcoming release on Monday, so, so thank you for joining the session. With that in mind, right, we wanted to make sure everyone is ready for Monday, that everybody's feeling comfortable about what to expect and where to find resources and ask questions, and that's what today's all about. And really what we want to cover today is, oh, there we go, um, wanted to talk, again, talk about, and you've probably seen this in the um, in the newsletters we've been sending out, but just how the 2023 forecast was developed and the background process improvements that we've made as an organization to in the development of the annual forecast. We also wanted to talk about the reach and frequency model. I know a lot of you on this call today are super excited about the new reach model coming out. So talk a little bit about how that was developed and give you, show you some examples of kind of what the, some of the results we're seeing. And then also, again, another big thing, transit station and scheduled fleet media being in the uh, Insight Suite and API for the first time in this current generation of geopath uh, media measurement. And then also uh, learn how to, to access all this stuff. There's a lot of support and information we've developed and actually um, uh, we have a 2023, um, you know, uh, resource kit available as of right now on our website that you can go and download and start to get all of these materials that you're going to see on every single slide on this deck. There's a one pager, there's a there's a FAQ or a video about it. So hopefully you'll you'll be able to find the support you need and then there's always geek out for, for any other questions. But to help me with all this, I just want to say we're super excited and want to welcome uh, some of our special guests. So we have today uh, Cheryl Zimmerman, VP of Sales Operations at Lamar, and Glennis Riley, VP of Out of Home at Horizon, both co-chairs of our Insights Committee, which was very instrumental in helping us uh, get to where we are today. And then Dylan Maven is here as well, our president of Geopath, and they'll take us through a lot of the discussion today. And then Brian Shopper, who's also on the, on the call and, and somebody who joins me joins me on these sessions uh, all the time. Uh, it will be here and we'll both talk about the uh, transit station media and, and do a uh, transit station as well as fleet and do a walkthrough of the, uh, of the uh, where to find and how to access that data. A couple last minute housekeeping rule, uh, housekeeping items before we do get started. So often we get asked, is this gonna be recorded? Yes, this will be recorded and be available on our website shortly after the session. Um, all, we will be taking questions. We wanna make sure we're, we're doing our best to answer all your questions. We're gonna save that to near the end of the sessions, but please feel free to, to add them. And please try to add it in the, the question, the Q and A widget versus the chat. Sometimes it gets hard to, to track when we're hopping between the two, the two of them. Um, and again, we'll do our best that we have a pretty ambitious uh, agenda today. So we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. If we, if you have some very specific questions, very technical questions, we may reach out to you directly or we'll reach out to you directly after the session to, to help answer your questions. Or, or also you may see these questions reflected in the FAQ document that we have. And we'll be adding to that as a living document as we go along this, this release and adoption. And I know I've been talking a lot. And so without further ado, I want to welcome into the session, Glynis, Cheryl, and Dylan and say thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, well, I really wanna reiterate, thank you, Cheryl and Glynis for all the effort that you've put into uh, making the, this data release possible. I uh, wanna thank, um, of course, all the members, um, everyone that's attending. This is a, a, a lot of attendees today. Uh, we couldn't do this without all of your support. Uh, thank you to the board of directors also, uh, and also our vendors and partners, uh, Tactable, MotionWorks, Terralytics for helping provide some of the infrastructure and information that's making all of this possible. So uh, without further ado, we can jump into uh, the evolution uh, of the 2023 uh, forecast and how we got to where we are today. Um, so as everyone knows, over the past couple of years, there's been quite a few chaotic events, changes, ebbs and flows in everyone's life. Um, and what we want to do today is really just 
center around and, and reset around what is the forecast? What, what does it represent? How did we create it? Um, and what does it mean for you? And, and what should you be taking away from that? So one of the things that we uh, wanna make sure everyone understands is like what data goes into the forecast. So we have access through the data partners I just mentioned, uh, information going all the way back well before pre-COVID uh, or to the pre-COVID period. And one of the biggest changes uh, in this release versus the two prior ones that were both in the midst of the, the chaos of, of the pandemic uh, was that this represents an entire year's worth of data, um, of observed data. So from September 21st through August 22nd, 2022, uh, and we're looking at this year over year, this 12 month period. So it's a much more stable view of what to expect uh, on every roadway out there for all of the audited assets that we measure. Um, and this change is gonna be a little bit different. So some of the fluctuations that we were seeing during some of the smaller windows that we were comparing previously to pre-COVID periods, you're not gonna see that as much. So there will be some changes, but again, this is a much more accurate, much more stable view uh, of the world today, which is which is great. So I'm very excited to have this in front of everybody. And like Scott said, there's a couple other improvements that we'll get into. So, like I said, there's a couple different changes out there, but one of the things I want to make sure we're level setting on is what is the forecast. So the the forecast represents for every single piece of inventory the the traffic circulation impressions for the roadways or the places that can view it. Right, so our team goes through and by hand looks at every single asset and makes sure we identify what roadways it can be seen from. Uh, and every single piece of inventory has unique data re that reflect the traffic and activity for that particular asset. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of data, but that's the level of granularity we know that people expect because if there's a piece of inventory, it's on one roadway and it's on the left side of the road or if it's across an intersection, the expectation, the reality is that people want those metrics to reflect those unique um, um, sort of situations. And that's what this is. Uh, like I said a second ago, this 2023 release reflects a full year of data compared year over year, going all the way back through to 2019. And so this is providing a much more stable forecast uh, overall compared to pre-COVID or even some of the mid-COVID releases that we provided. So this is going to, I think a lot of people are gonna really enjoy sort of the, the uh, say the stability and the, uh, the comparability across all of your inventory, both for the operators and the planners, everyone in between that's trying to uh, build insights around this. Uh, one of the other things that this is the first generation of geopath measurement that also includes scheduled fleet and transit station media. Now, in the TAB days, we did have some of this capability as we moved over, we completely overhauled and there's a lot of great improvements and precision and accuracy in that. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, and then also uh, one of my favorite subjects, region frequency, we've also vastly improved how we are calculating and estimating region frequency in this model um, that reflects not just some of the survey data that we had access to before, but also uh, observed data. And this is, again, sort of like a secondary um, silver lining of a lot of the effort that happened during COVID was our ability to learn from um, the mobile location data that we now have access to through our partners to understand from a empirical, empirically, how does reach and frequency grow uh, across inventory at a particular asset, across different types of inventory, different package sizes, et cetera. So having that reality to then build models off of has been a, a great improvement over the past previous releases. So. Those are the big takeaways that I wanted to make sure we hit on. And I'm not sure Cheryl and Glennis, there's anything that you feel is incredibly important that we should probably highlight from your point of view. Yeah, I mean, um, internally, one of the things that I'm making sure to point out here, and, and I think it's really important to just repeat it and call it out, is that this is the first opportunity our industry has had to work with a full 12 months of, uh, stable is a great word, post-pandemic population movement data. So like at the spot level or the panel level, you're might, you might not see a really significant change depending on where you are, um, but it signifies a return to some normalcy. 
And it also um, brings back the ability for us um, in terms of measurement to get back to the goal of achieving a higher confidence and precision in our year over year forecast moving forward. So getting back to an impression that's based on the past 12 months of observed movement data, where the observed movement data isn't completely crazy because of a pandemic, it puts us in a state of continuously updating our impressions in order to reflect how our population travel behavior is always continuously changing. So I just, I always want to call that out because, you know, you might see the data release and you don't maybe notice when you're looking at the spot level, a significant impression change, but the change on the back end is that we can kind of get back to the regularly scheduled program of like continuously improving that geopath roadmap. Right, instead of being so reactionary, which right. is what we've had to do yeah. over the past few years. Um, and also, I mean, think about it. This is the first time we're going to be able to look at measurement in one common denominator, having transit along with traditional mixed together, right? So we can actually look at a true measurement source. We can tell a really strong story to clients now from a measurement perspective, um, not where we're mixing different sorts of measurement models together. And then from a buyer side, reach and frequency is obviously one of our key, key benchmarks that we're constantly looking at throughout the entire planning process. We look at it to help set budgets. We help, we look at it to tell stories to clients, all these different things, understanding weight in the market. And I think based on the numbers that we've seen just during all of the testing over the past few months, I think that the numbers we're going to see uh, really help to tell that story and really instill a lot of confidence across our clients and our agencies and all of our vendor partners. Um, There's some examples coming down later in the presentation that I think will help um, contextualize all this for everyone. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I'm, you, you, you both hit on a bunch of stuff that I feel like is what we need, not just as an organization, but as a channel is we need information that helps reflect of reality, we need to have metrics that are usable to help leverage out of home strategically and being able to have not just TRPs and impressions for target audiences, but have that reach and frequency metric that we can rely upon helps really paint that narrative and value proposition, depending on how people, whatever their strategy may be. Um, so I think that that's gonna be a huge, huge advantage moving forward. So I'm really happy to bring this to the, to the membership. Um, to that end about having sort of that common denominator, that's something else that Geopath has really been focusing on about really expanding the footprint of our audit inventory um, and rolling in scheduled fleet, no pun intended, transit station media, it has truly exploded the footprint of what we now are able to, to bring to our members. So we're well over 1 million audited assets in our inventory database. Um, that we have metrics for. And you can, again, compare apples to apples across all those different media classifications, over 100 transit systems, uh, thousands upon thousands of place-based media locations, uh, inventory, over 2,000 um, uh, transit stations. So uh, it's a huge footprint uh, and growing continuously. And so we're really excited about making sure that our members have this comprehensive view this map of the world to be able to, to buy, plan, and transact confidently. So very excited about this rollout. And of course, scheduled fleet and transit new for this year. So uh, some of the other things I want to make sure everyone knows, and this is, again, like Scott said, this is kind of like a high-level FAQ. We want to hit on some of the most important parts. New inventory, transit place-based, uh, scheduled fleet, um, one of the other things is we've really focused on core audiences. We This was a very data-driven decision here. We wanted to make sure that we led with a, a, a limited scope rather than inundating the market with over 8,000 audiences like we had before. It was a little overwhelming for a lot of folks to be able to integrate consistently. We wanna make sure that we sort of take a couple of baby steps as we roll out this forecast, really focusing on accuracy and precision, and then expanding upon that. So on day one, on Monday, we'll have just a, a little over 100 unique demographic audience segments. 68 prison premier audience segments is sort of like the um, uh, audience segmentation um, that some people are familiar with. That's going to be available on Monday. 
and then as we go through our monthly release cycle, like we normally have been, we're going to be rolling out additional audiences as necessary. So uh, we're going to be adding a couple of consumer profiles, additional demographics into the mix starting as soon as March 31st, which is our next upcoming uh, release. So Dylan, if there's an audience segment that I pulled every day on a daily basis, the chances are pretty high that it's going to be available there. Yeah, there was there were a, a clear set of audiences that sort of raised to the top that we saw more significantly more activity than others. But that long tail of audiences that may have been used once over the past three years that may have not been included in this first release. So um, again, in the FAQs, we do have a list of all audiences that are included and we'll be updating that ahead of time to know when those next ones are going to go into the sort of the, the subsequent batches. So uh, one of the other things that we want to make sure we're uh, cognizant of, respectful of, uh, accommodating of, supporting of, is adopting this, right? It's a little unfair for us to say, okay, Monday, everybody switch over. We've got, I don't know, 5,000 salespeople in the industry, countless systems that need to be integrated. Our data set or the inventory data set, the impression data, we are trying to support our members to provide that foundation across all systems. So ideally, we want to have everyone's clock synced. Not everyone's going to be ready on day one. So this is important to pay attention. <laughs> Uh, so on, on Monday, the forecast will be available. We'll be in the Insight Suite. It'll also be available in API 2.2. And 2.2 is a new API version, very important because it's the only place where you can get the 2023 release and transit um, and scheduled fleet media. So that's important. Um, so you can start using it Monday. Um, after a what we're calling an adoption period right we want to support people as they're integrating this and we want everyone to be switched over and using it april 3rd so there's a couple of weeks for everyone to sort of open it up understand what's happening start utilizing reach and frequency from us like like you may have used to uh, ask questions um you know we're, we're here we'll talk about that also we're available to help support you uh, with your uh, adoption of it but there is some nuance here and Glennis and Cheryl, I need you to help me out with this, but yeah. um, one of the things that is so important and frankly, as we move forward in the world where data becomes a part of our conversation, we really need to have this button up. We always need to disclose what data set you're using and also on the receiving end, confirm what it is that you're receiving just to be buttoned up on that. So there's going to be a period where you may have a couple different versions of data that are going to be coming up from different clients, uh, different vendors, and that's okay. This is sort of a transition period. So we want to make sure we're supportive of all of those members, wherever they are along this adoption cycle. Right. Yeah, um, it's very important. Oh, go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah. Um, I totally agree on, you know, first of all, it, uh, from a seller standpoint, um, I think that we all just need to be mindful too, to go back to the buyer and remind them, you know, when you're, you can have a 911 RFP and you don't always necessarily think, oh, wait, that's right. We're in the middle of a data release transition. So we need to make sure to take a second to determine and ask, like, just to be clear, are you asking for this data release or are you asking for that? I mean, it's got to be a nightmare for the demand side to have to attempt to evaluate a package across multiple different releases. So that, that's got to be a problem in and of itself. But when it also comes to the, um, you know, the transition part of this, right? Just how is this going to look during this month of, of um, getting accustomed to this data while we're also still doing our day-to-day -day work? Um, I can say from the operator perspective, very specifically for transit and fleet packages, essentially they're going to need to be rebuilt from the ground up. And so I would think for us and other transit operators, it's going to take a little heads down and research time for us to work through this new data at a market by market level and make sure that the answers we're giving back to our buyers and to our customers are correct 
and that our sellers understand fully the packages and how it all fits into a comprehensive out of home package. And I would think, Glennis, it probably looks like a very similar process on your end, except for you've also got a an advertiser to talk to. Right. And I think this is going to be a time I'm when Dylan, when we all had these conversations a few weeks ago about setting this adoption period, I think it's so important that we all use this time to really take our pl our plans, right? So we've got, this is the 2023 annual forecast. We've probably already got 2023 annual PERM programs that are already out there that the clients have already seen. So this is a time that we can start looking at what the new forecast does to the current program. I don't think it should be anything glaring from all the tests that we've done, but if there is something, this is a time to work with the vendors, work with Geopath. Hey, something doesn't look right. Let's flag it. Um, it's also a time to be using all the resources that Scott and the Geopath team have built out so that we're educating ourselves so that we can in turn educate that back to clients um, because this is an evolution, right? The measurement does keep changing and we keep getting smarter and smarter. And as Dylan loves to say, it's always an estimate. <laughs> so it's just super important that we're clarifying what data source we're using and that vendors are also telling us which data source they are providing us the information with. But then from the buyer side, um, that we're patient with vendors as they, especially with the transit piece and the fleet piece, start adopting that and providing, I mean, you saw the numbers a few slides ago, there's so many, almost as many pieces of fleet as there are traditional across the country. So it's gonna be a huge undertaking. So there's gonna be some patience with the rollout. So I think having the four to five week adoption period is just really smart and we should all use our time really uh, wisely and work together to figure it all out. Yeah, I, I'm excited about it. And it is, I think, all the questions that are going to pop up. I mean, it is an education uh, opportunity. Uh, also an opportunity to reassess on the client side, re revisiting what the objectives are. So, and I think that that's a, a really uh, excellent opportunity for our, our channel in general to, to revisit that uh, in, a, in a meaningful way and now have some really good information to, to go back and, and uh, provide good answers. Um, all right, and so the next thing uh, with regard to the, the the forecast. So, how can you access it? You know, when is it available? How can you access it? So, it's going to be available in the Insight Suite starting on Monday. Um, also, in the APIs, and the, those APIs are integrated across many systems. Uh, you're going to have to talk with those individual providers to find out exactly when those adoptions and integrations are happening, uh, and Again, like you, you two just said, it's going to take some time because, again, we have had hundreds of hours of members. And again, thank you again to the user acceptance testing group from the Insights Committee. Um, we've been beating this thing up left, right, upside down um, to make sure that we identify as much as possible about how to make sure everything's moving smoothly. Um, but we also have some questions uh, about sort of, well, what do I do in the interim? The 2021 mid-year forecast still is going to be supported by Geopath, and it will be probably for the remainder of the year. We are deprecating older forecasts. We are getting rid of the 2020 and the initial 2021 forecasts. Those are going away, so those will not be available in the Insight Suite, and those will not be available in API 2.1. Uh, 2023 data will be available in 2.2. Uh, 2021 mid-year data will be available in 2.1. So. That's going to be sort of this transitional period. Again, adoption, we're pushing for everyone to have everything integrated into their systems, into their business processes by April 3rd. Um, and you kind of alluded to this. Um, some considerations, I just want to make sure that everyone keeps this in mind. These are estimates. It is impossible to know absolutely everything about every single pop person, um, unless you had your tinfoil hat on, perhaps. Uh, but this is an estimate, and it is a very empirically driven estimate, but it is a model. There are going to be some fluctuations that people are seeing as we're putting in different packages together, and you may have some questions. Never hesitate to reach out to us if you have questions. Again, it's an educational opportunity. You may be able to learn a little bit more about our methods and why you're seeing the metrics that you're seeing. Um, there are also a lot of inventory that people are still reviewing. Again, this is the first time that some people are seeing transit 
uh, and fleet media for, and, and it's a lot to ingest. It's literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of inventory. So it's gonna take a little bit of time. And again, as we're working with our members, we don't want to, we want to manage this change. We don't wanna cause harm. We wanna make sure that this is supportive of people. And so as people are reviewing their inventory, we're gonna be releasing that into uh, the published data set, but not everything is gonna be there on day one. So there are some inventory that are being held back either because of QA on our side or questions that uh, members are trying to make sure that they're wrapping their heads around some of this new information. And for anybody on the development side of the world, um, documentation is available online. If you have any questions on it, reach out to API support at geopath.org, but our developer portal does have a comprehensive release notes, uh, change logs, et cetera, uh, for any support. So I want to make sure we touched on this a little bit before we moved on. Um, and then where to go to, for additional help. Like I said, there's the uh, API support at geopath.org, but you may be running into a couple of scenarios over the next couple of weeks, the rest of your career. Here's what to do if you get any of these questions. So if you're not seeing inventory metrics, if you're not seeing impressions for a particular piece of inventory, place space, roadside, wherever, wherever it may be, reach out to uh, your, if you're a media operator, reach out to the media operations team. Uh, you'll, you'll, you know who your contact is. They can help track down, get you an answer about where something is if you're not seeing something as you expect it. Um, if there's a big change, again, like we said, the last release was in the middle of the pandemic. There is going to be some changes. Um, call us. We'll walk you through what we're seeing year over year over year. Talk about where the data is coming from so we can help make sure that you feel comfortable with the, the new information. Um, some other examples you might have, again, this kind of goes back to not every single piece of inventory. The vast majority of everything's in there. It's ready to go. But there are going to be a handful out there. If you're not seeing something, please reach out to geekout uh, at geopath.org. Uh, similar, if you're in the insight suite and you're trying to figure out how to use um, the, the, the UI to create a report or whatever it may be, reach out uh, to geek out. But also remember, there is a, a plethora of information. Scott and his, his team has done a really great job. Again, support from the insights committee, futures council, lots of lots of feedback. And so this was developed with a lot of uh, stakeholders to make sure that this was very good information that helped answer your question. So go to the geek out library, the learning lab. Well, chances are there's going to be some material there that can answer your question. Hey, Dylan. I um. I'm an expert on asking for help. And so you know, this one definitely stands out to me. I um, would just say like my best advice based on experience of reporting issues in order to get a good and productive resolution from Geopath is to try to share as much of your local market knowledge and your existing data sources that you're currently looking at that you have. So like, if I'm spotting an impression or some package numbers that don't seem quite right, um, I try to resist the urge, um, which is strong sometimes to say, I don't feel like this, this just this doesn't feel right. But like when I feel like a review is in order, the more I find that I'm able to give Geopath or the analysts I'm working with, like what other data sources I'm looking at in comparison, I, I get a re resolution faster, but and, and it could just be traffic numbers. It could be some local volume number, some local transportation or population number that you happen to know. Um, I feel like a lot of times Geopath really does appreciate hearing like what other sources are we seeing that we're trying to validate against because I mean, they're, they can't be the local market expert of every local market. And that's a lot of times where our expertise can really help. And I, um, I, I really appreciate the point about, you know, some of the custom situation or some of the measures that might be missing. And I, I also wanted to kind of call out that, you know, particularly for the new measures like fleet, we're all going to have a, at least a few custom market scenarios or some large network packages that the insight suite doesn't currently accommodate or wasn't built to create for us yet. And we're going to need this transition time also just over the next few weeks to identify those things and work with Geopath to get their data support for us to help us answer some of those custom questions. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl, for pointing that out. Um, especially on the, you know, pr providing your local insight. We, we have access to hundreds of millions of data points, 
you know, in any given instant. Um, there's tens of thousands of traffic count. I think it's like a million and a half traffic count locations across the country that we have access to. It's a huge dataset, but it doesn't, we don't necessarily have direct source data on every single photo, which is one of the reasons why we've built this process to be able to understand full population movement. It helps fill in those gaps. But if you have something that we can't see, don't have access to, please bring it to us. We'll never turn it away. It's always very helpful to help direct us where there might be a gap in, 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 our, in our view. So um, very much appreciate that. And it certainly will help expedite any sort of resolution. All right, reach and frequency. My favorite. So some of the things that have changed around reach and frequency. This is such a hot topic. Um, reach and frequency is a, an incredibly important metric to understand the context of the audience weight that is being delivered. Is it a million impressions for one person that just saw the same ad a million times? Or is it uh, distributed over time? Is it happened over a week, over you know, four weeks, et cetera? Um, and the big change, again, comes from our ability to understand empirically how reach builds over time. And this, this is one of the learnings that came out of our, our, our effort to try to understand in near real time, contemporarily, what's happening today. But being able to have access to that data and looking back over time, being able to look at actual packages, we actually ended up re leveraging, uh, I think it ended up being like 150,000 unique package scenarios that had been created in the insight suite to use as real world examples to go back, look at observed data, look at what the observed reaches, look at the attributes about the particular pieces of the inventory, target audiences, where they are in the marketplace, where the population's distributed in the marketplace to help us understand what are the important factors that drive reach and frequency to be able to come up with an estimate for if I have these pieces of inventory, they all have their reach and frequency, but collectively, what does that do over time? And so this new uh, new approach has helped us build this sort of consistent model across all of the media that we audit. I'm really excited about it. We'll touch base a little bit more details in here. So again, through the top level reach and frequency, every single piece of inventory in our system has a unique footprint of where it built, uh, where it, uh, derives audience. And so if you look at sort of the shaded blocks in this area and these individual pieces of inventory, this is sort of the, the footprint or coverage, the geographical coverage in a market where those inventories draw audience. It's the place of residence of people that are walking or driving on those individual roadways that can see that asset. And every single unique piece of inventory in, on our database has a unique footprint because of the nature of the unique traffic and the speed and the dwell time, et cetera. So every single piece of inventory is special uh, and everyone goes together like a unique puzzle piece. So it's not, a, it's not a simple problem to solve, but having this data to have real world information to understand how they, how they fit together has helped us really crack this in a way that we never could before. Uh, so the next slide, and again, this one for all those math folks out there, um, slide on the left, bad. Image on the right, much better. The alignment of what we're seeing in the real world versus the models that we've been able to create are um, uh, within a, a, few, a few reach points. And that is what has really changed in this release is that the cumulative reach and frequency that you're gonna see when you're putting inventory in a pack, package is going to make sense. It's going to feel good because it is right. And we have the metrics to back it up. We have observed data that we've been able to verify against, some data to train against, other data to test it against. And we're seeing that alignment incredibly performant. So that's this is a really great thing. I love this slide, but not everyone does. Okay. <laughs> so when it looks at the output of it, and here is a, a, a pretty... Uh, I'll say embarrassing example, but glad to know that we have a, a great output now. Previously, this package in Los Angeles, inventory all over the market. People were calling us before saying, what the heck? This does not make sense. 14 reach, I don't believe you. And that was awful. So I never want to go through that again. 
I don't want you to have information that you don't feel comfortable putting in front of your clients. Uh, and now, as you can see in the 2023 release, uh, those same 56 units, a little bit of fluctuation of impressions overall, nothing catastrophic. Uh, but the big difference that you see when you're comparing these two versions of the data is that the package now delivers 68% uh, reach. I think this was over, what, eight weeks. So this is a much more meaningful, accurate representation of the impact of this package. And you, Glennis and Cheryl, you tell me, but like yeah. you being able to take yeah. the, the, I mean, the second row. Yeah. The scatter plots were beautiful, but... Like, this is the thing that really matters to me most about the improvements in the region frequency model, it, because it's resolving issues where our numbers, particularly for packages like this, just didn't make sense compared to the local market population or really just anything that we know from common sense logic about the market in this situation, the LADMA. Um, and that's really the worst kind of pain point to have as far as as far as my job is concerned, because when you're not sure why there's a problem, it's so difficult to know how to explain it or it's difficult to know what you can feel confident in. So I'm just I'm looking forward to seeing those unexplainable problems like this 2021 example go away. I mean, the in market frequency is 41 times. In eight weeks, I mean, it just come on it so it uh it all that matters to us is that these kind of outputs that we had been seeing particularly for packages are going away and you know it's just reflective of a, just a more intelligent and more precise model it's something we can all be confident about right instead of questioning. yeah yep and if you do see anything that looks weird please bring it to our attention uh we also I mean, I'm I'm very excited about sort of this year with Geopath too because we've uh, we've been building a great team here recently. We've got uh, new engineering talent, we've got new infrastructure talent, and we're able to help uh, improve things as our members are bringing to uh, to our attention um, at a resolution time that hasn't we just have never had. Um, so very excited about that too. So. I think it was on one of the insights committee calls recently, like we're, we're always going to be, was one of the, our member developers was like, well, we're going to have this release and then we're going to have improvements and improvements and improvements forever. And I think that that's a little scary to say, but the reality is we're here to constantly improve. And if there's anything that we identify that we can improve upon, we will put effort toward that. Uh, but one of the things that's also been great is working with our committees to make sure that we're all aligned strategically on what are the priorities? What do we do first? What do we need to do? Because there is an infinite amount of things that can be done, but what do we need to do first and foremost? And that's another reason why when, you, when we talk about sort of the scope of this release, um, you know, fewer audiences really focusing on the quality of that foundational data so that we can start getting information back in your hands so you can be confident when you go to your clients and put numbers that help tell the story that you know is real. All right, enough about RNF. All right, transit uh, and scheduled fleet media. This is also something that I'm really excited to bring to the market, but you've heard enough out of me. I'll pass it back over to Scott. Yes, thank you. And thank you for all that. I was. Uh just enjoying the conversation amongst you all as well. And got some nice comments about the reach and frequency. So I think everybody's excited about the reach and frequency as we as we are. We um, make little t-shirts to say I heart RNF. <laughs> right, right. Um, so I wanted to come on and, and just talk a little bit about the, the, the our approach to transit as well as scheduled fleet talk to you a little bit about what's changed and, and why some of these changes matter. Again, very high level, like we've been saying on this webinar, but this, this slide in particular, as well as some of the other ones that I'm going to be covering, they're all available as one pagers. And we're all here and I'll, we'll, uh, uh, at the end of this, we'll show you where, where to get all that. I just want to talk quickly about how do, how do we get to it? How do we get to our numbers? And first, what we need to do is understand the station venue circulation, right? Uh, we need to know, um, you know, where people are going, where people are coming into that, into that venue, so to speak. And again, being able to leverage mobile data has been really 
huge for us in addition to the ridership data, which we used in the past. And again, I'll talk about that and what's changed and why it matters. But then once we understand the circulation of the venue, we need to understand people's movement within the venue and their, their propensity to pass by any one of these units within, within the venue. Um, and so we get, not everybody has the same opportunity. They're not all in the same place to see the, every single unit that is in a venue. So we need to understand based on placement, based on the number of exits, based on the number of entrances and turnstiles, et cetera, we need to understand their propensity to move around within this venue. And then again, connect that to connect these visits to the actual uh, interior station media to really start to understand those attributes like dwell time and where where are they in the venue and what is their likelihood to engage to see that unit. And then again, we move into craft calculating audience delivery. So high level, we need to understand propensity people to come into the station where they are, where they're moving within the station, those trips that bring them past any particular piece of inventory, and then we're able to calculate the, the metrics based on that. But what this is, as Dylan alluded to, like the, we, we've changed and we've upgraded how we're how our approach and what are some of the big improvements that we've made and been able to make based on the level of data that we have, but also the um, just our, our methodology overall. So I've started to, I kind of, alluded to, to some of these already. So this idea of placement type. Previously, it was just limited to concourse and platform, but now we're able to, to better note where the where the inventory exists within a venue. So if it's at a fair machine, you know, or if it's in an elevator or a column or places like that, we're better able to understand that and account for that. And then similarly, as you move towards the different types of structures that we now have, we've been able to expand that much, much to much greater detail. So things like turnstiles, ceilings, columns, stairs, we're able to understand and have measurement for all those different structure types. And then understanding venue circulation, we're now being able to bring in that mobile data, we're able to better understand and account for all different audiences within the venue, where they're moving, what their purposes, are they there for dinner, are they doing what are the, where are they going within the venue? What are, what's their purpose within the venue as well? So again, are they going to some place like Penn Station doing some shop, shopping or grabbing lunch versus even just because you have some of these multi-use stations. So we're better able to understand that. And as well as in addition to that dwell time uh, is now calculated being able to use passing dwell or an extended dwell, are they in a waiting area? All of those things, are coming into play and, and, and are acknowledged in our new measurement uh, with transit station. And then in addition to that, um, the venue layout. So understanding you know, the, the visitation and how that ultimately impacts the, the, the venue itself. How many levels are there? How many platforms and concourses are there? So again, all of that is now taken into account. So more holistically, we're able to get a more precise picture of what's happening in these venues and understand how that impacts overall measurement. Um, anything else, Dylan, you'd want to add to, to that? Not to put you on the spot, but um, anything that I know? We no, I mean, I think that this is, I mean, the, the same concepts are, are applied across every single one of our inventory that we measure and audit, right? You have to understand traffic. You need to then, for vehicular traffic, convert that into circulation. How many people? Because we don't just count cars. We don't really care about cars. We want to count people in cars. And then same thing goes for place-based media. We need to understand the foot traffic. How, how long are they there? That's one of the reasons why dwell time is so important. How long has that person spent inside of that uh, venue? And then also being able to break out extended dwell versus passing if it's in a food court, if it's in a bar, or if it's in a waiting room, there's people that are going to be there just walking through the area, okay. passing. There's people that are going to be there for a longer period of time. That's incredibly important because it has an impact on the number of opportunities you're going to have to see potentially if it's digital rotating how many ads are displayed how many opportunities to see you have and then also depending on what that engagement is that dwell time passing through it that affects the likelihood to see so the the probability of you actually looking at and then consuming that uh, is important so all of these considerations are taken into account now today 
we report likelihood to see impressions. This is at the top of the you'll hear a lot. MRC is rolling out with uh, out of home standards. So this is this isn't the last time that you'll hear this talked about. Um, but there's lots of different metrics out there, and they're all very meaningful. And I think that's one of the other interesting things with Geopath that we have done LTS metrics, visibility adjusted um, impressions, viewable impressions, eyes are not viewable, eyes on impressions. That's what we've been doing for a long time. But all of that other information exists behind the scenes. We have the ability to start rolling that out to, to people because that's important context as people are planning. Just like reach and frequency is very good context for total and total impressions. All those other metrics can help inform: Do I put a short creative? A, a, you know, what's the dwell time? Like all of those things are important. And so, being able to start adding that in in the future again, I'm not saying this is going to happen on Monday, but there's a lot more information behind the scenes that we do want to start moving forward. But place-based transit station media, it's a huge step forward. And there are so many different nuances that go into it. So again, if you have questions on the numbers that you're getting back from us, call us. There's lots of lots of information that goes into it and walk you through it. And just the flip side of talking about scheduled fleet or scheduled fleet approach. And I appreciate too, Dylan, that you, you said that, you know, it, the recipe is relatively the same for, for whatever we're doing to some extent, right? And I think this slide in particular even reflects that, right? This is about scheduled fleet media. But if I look at the first two things, the household population data and nationwide location and movement data, if you looked at this slide, which we built for roadside, those are very the exactly the same steps, right? We need to understand the population. We need to understand the demographics, their behaviors, their attitudes, their psychographics. Simultaneously, we need to understand where everybody's moving, right, across the country and creating this, this, this trip matrix and really understanding that. And the thing with scheduled fleet, right, we need to understand the vehicles, where they're going. Right. And it's nice with schedule suite. Again, we know where they are going to be. And so we're 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 layering that that amount, that um, portion uh, in terms of scheduled stops or the GPS pings into understanding where those trips two things coincide, where somebody is their trip coincides with this, where that piece of inventory is going to be moving by. And so again, that again, it's similar but different, adding another layer of just understanding to to it. And again, like I said earlier, this slide is available also as a one pager. But I want to talk about some of the things that have changed and improved about how we look at scheduled fleet and why they're important. So routing in particular, previously we used to route um, in terms of how the crow flies, right? Where it's going to be. Now we're able to better account for because of the level of data we have, a really better understand the, the routing of the vehicles. And really, because we have this GPS data and we're able to really understand uh, the, the movement of them and really account for each of the, the different uh, turns and roadways that they are taking. And similar, I'm sorry, I thought you were going to say. Uh, similarly, um, understanding with this GP, GPS data as well, um, again, we're accounting for understanding that not every route is run every single day, and holiday schedules are different than weekend schedules, and you know, different than weekday schedules. So again, taking that into greater account than we have been previously able to, and then again, the, this granularity of the circulation like we've talked about, allows us to really understand, and again, those opportunities to where people are interacting and coming across the inventory. In particular, again, the level of precision and granularity we have, a good example is like if you're talking about split, split roadways, for example, previously, we weren't, we weren't able to get down to that level of granularity where we can now identify that and how does that account for who can and cannot view that piece of inventory. So that is a key part. And those last two, I know we're starting to tie in time. So in terms of ad placement and ad impressions, another big, big evolution that we're excited about is now we have uh, ratings for all, all sides, driver side, passenger side, as well as headlight and taillights and can look at impressions for, for full lap, full wrapped media types as well. So um, a lot of changes. And again, like I said, this is also, I know I went through it fairly quickly, but this is also available in a uh, little bit more detail for you if you want to dig into it afterwards. And, and also, 
Um, I just want to acknowledge to Brian. Brian and I will come back in a couple of weeks with a, a deeper dive into this and kind of walk through some of um, uh, some more detail uh, on this as well as uh, where to find this in the insight suite. Because I do want to hand real, real quick before we hop over to that. One thing that I think bears repeating um, or noting on this is the underlying traffic data and people movement and uh, pedestrian data is the exact same data set that we're using for roadside media as we are for the vehicles that are traveling on those roadways. So that's also a, an in, you know, behind the scenes, it's a huge improvement because when we're trying to then reconcile and compare across fleet, place-based transit, roadside, same data. It's incredibly important. And so that helps play into not only an apples to apples comparison when we are looking at total traffic exposure, all that, but also when we're looking at all the components that we can leverage to accurately measure region frequency. So these are, you know, interesting things behind the scene, but I think it's really important to know that when you're talking about fleet exterior and roadside media, they're talking about the same traffic data that's driving the audience impressions for both of those. That's it. Yeah, no, that's exciting. Um, I do want to hand it off to, to Brian, who's going to give us a, a really high level walkthrough of how you can access some of this data in the Insight Suite. Before I do do that, I just want to say, because I know we've been alluding to it, um, all of these materials are available in the Geek Out Library right now. If you went to our website, you get directed there. Um, there is a comprehensive FAQ doc that can direct you to every other piece of uh, credentials, every other one page or every other video that we've created here. Um, hopefully it answers the majority of questions, but again, as always, if you have more, reach out to us at geekout at geopath.org, but there's a bunch of one pagers on reaching frequency, fleet, transit, as well as also some video tutorials and user guides that, that go along with those for learning how to, to get the, the transit and schedule suite data out of, out of the Insight Suite. So like I've been saying, hopefully this is going to help everybody feel comfortable, but always, as always, we are here to, to help. Um, so I want to stop sharing. I'm going to let Brian share his screen, and um, please feel free to ask questions. I think some of the questions that have come in have, have already been answered, but if you have one that you're wondering about and have not had an answer, please post it. Oops, I guess I did. All right. All right, great. Scott, are you able to see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Um, so like Scott said, I'm just going to give a quick run through a uh, very high level. We're going to revisit this in just under two weeks. So just a high level overview of some important things that I think uh, just good to know about as you start to experience the data for the first time. Um, so you'll notice when you come in here, once this is live, you'll see the 2023 data source right here. Um, most of the overall Explorer display is pretty much the same. There's just a couple of key things I wanna point out that I think will be useful. Um, so in the media class filter, you'll notice there are a few different filters here. Uh, roadside as you've been seeing it before, but this is a nice easy way to, schedule, or to filter for just scheduled fleet. Um, and transit station media is part of our place-based category. So if you're looking for anything that is transit station, you'll find that in place-based. One of the other key important things I want to point out here, um, with the rollout of the 2023 forecast and just the 2.2 API in general, you'll notice within the operator's filter, there's two sort of sub-filters in here now, the organizations and then the division name filter. Within organizations, this is useful for filtering to an overall transit operator, an overall roadside operator, um, a lot of the standard things that you've seen before, but this is really useful if you are trying to look at all of the inventory of a particular transit system, say the MTA here in New York City, uh, New Jersey Transit, um, Los, Angeles, Los Angeles County Metro. Um, if you switch over to the division name, this allows you to get more specific with those selections. So, for example, like MTA bus, or if I were to look up Los Angeles, for example, I can pull up the Los Angeles County Metro Authority. Um, but this is also useful if you're trying to filter for specific divisions within different roadside operators as well. So, like if you just want to look at Lamar's Los Angeles inventory or Capital Outdoors Los Angeles inventory. So, this can be helpful for that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to just filter to this, and also I wanted to pull up, where is it, the Starline tours here really quick. 
Um, just one quick thing I wanted to show in the bottom view of the Explore module, and then I'll quickly hop over and show how to run a market plan at, at a high level. So one of the things that I just wanted to highlight very quickly, there are a few different um, columns within your view here that I think will be useful um, specifically for looking at scheduled fleet. Um, and these might be things that you'll need to add to your view here, but I think will be useful in general. So place name, um, when you're dealing with scheduled fleet, the place name is reflective of what garage those buses are coming from. So if you're looking to target a specific garage, you can use that information. Um, the media name filter will show you the specific type of ad for that bus. So full wrap, full side, king, queen, things like that. Um, placement type is really useful because this will help you differentiate between a passenger side or driver side. Um, and just a couple other things like the organization own and manage, just some different things that I think will be useful that you might not need in roadside, but might be helpful for scheduled fleet. Um, really quick, I know we're getting tight on time. I'm just gonna hop over to the workspace and just show how to set up a, a market plan for some scheduled fleet inventory. Um, in talking with our different committees and different uh, councils and things like that, uh, it's, it's become pretty clear that a lot of people will be building packages for scheduled fleet using market plan and sort of looking at the overall system in market. So I'm just going to set up a really, really quick market plan to show you here. So I'm going to do 18 plus. I'm going to keep it in that Los Angeles DMA there. And so again, when you're setting up your operators, you have the organizations and the divisions filter. And I'm just going to search for Los Angeles. So I'm going to pull in uh, the outfront Los Angeles Metro and then also Vectors got these Starline tours. So I'm going to basically be building a plane here across a few different scheduled fleet operators. And you could do this same kind of thing if you wanted to mix roadside and scheduled fleet. So you could just add in roadside media as well. So for my media selection, media class, I'm going to select scheduled fleet. And then here I want to look at full sides, full side. And again, I know I'm going super quick. We're going to revisit this. This is just a high level walkthrough. Um, and to Scott's point, there are support materials for basically all of this in the Geek Out library. So I'm going to set up a four week plan, 200 TRPs across those four weeks. So 50 weekly TRPs. And we'll generate that really quick. Perfect. So I can open this up and then I can see the delivery, how my how my plan is split across the two different operators. You can see my 200 TRP goal here split about 100 and 100. And I can see the different reach percents and the amount of spots that this is recommending from each of these different operators in order to reach my goal of 200, and T, or 200 TRPs. And so from here, just like with roadside, you can go in and edit the number of spots, the TRPs, or now with the 2023 release, you now have the ability to edit the reach percent and also plan on a reach percent for market plan as well, which is a big thing a lot of people are excited to see come back. Um, but like I said, you can do this with scheduled fleet, with roadside, all different types of media, all within a singular plan. Um, it functions very similarly to roadside. So I think there should be hopefully minimal uh, hiccups along the way. But like I said, we've got plenty of materials waiting for you in the Geek Out library. Um, I think that was it. Scott, I'm going to hand it back over. Can I ask a quick question? I think um, in the Geek Out library, I'm looking at some tutorials and training videos, the scheduled fleet planning by garage videos. Those are complementary to what you just did. Yes. So That's there great. are... There are four different, right now there are four different tutorial videos and four accompanying user guides. Um, so if, if you need a video tutorial or like a step-by-step -step guide, um, we have four different things about transit station and also um, scheduled fleet media in there, as well as a lot of different one pagers and the FAQ document I think will be really useful. Great. So um, we're coming to the end. I just wanna say thank you. So. Cheryl and Glennis and Dylan and Brian and everybody who was on the on the session listening in. Um, we're gonna come back and do this again because we know there's a lot to take in. And you know, the release is gonna happen on Monday and you may have different questions, you know, and and so we want to come back and be available to everybody. So we're looking at March 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We'll start to uh, share that in newsletters with registration links um, very soon. But again, just wanted to let you know, this isn't the last time you're hearing from us. We're always here with Geek Out, but we also wanted to be available with um, with another, another session. And again, thank you. Um, if there's any other questions, I feel like we've 
uh, it's been kind of really interesting watching the questions some would come in and I'm like oh that's the next slide so I'm feeling good and hopefully we've been able to to address people's questions but again we didn't um, feel free to reach out to us directly or you may have a different question as I want you to lead the session where you're like oh I wish I asked this go ahead and ask us at geek out and we'll we'll help you find an answer so but again I do want to say thank you thank you again to Cheryl and Gwyneth, just for all the support and help um, with like developing these materials, but also just the guidance throughout throughout. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Come back anytime. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, yeah, you thanks, everybody. Really appreciate you all out there. Couldn't have done this without your support. Yes. Have a great one.